Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 70th session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. And this week, we have Tiangu Zhang from Stanford here with us to speak about his work on denoising diffusion MRIs. Um, he's a first year PhD student at, in the, at Stanford University, and he's currently working with the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Sydney under the supervision of Professor Wei Dong Kai. He was awarded Honors Class 1 and the University Medal. And his research uh, interests are in machine learning and computer vision. So thanks so much, Tiangu, for joining us today. And um, before we actually get started, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Um, I actually don't have any preferences. If you have any question, just uh, let me know. OK. Great. Oh, I apologize for the background noise, but um, as usual, let's make uh, try to make this session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Tiango. Sure, definitely. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm really glad that I can have this opportunity to um, connect to the friends from different backgrounds and communities. Um, today, my presentation is about denoising diffusion model for denoising diffusion MRIs. Oops. Hey, uh, yeah. So uh, a short recap about myself. Uh, my name is Tian Gexiang, and I received my honors degree of uh, Vision of Science from the University of Sydney, Australia. And I was graduated with honors class one and the university medal. Uh, I'm currently a first year PhD student in computer science at um, Stanford Vision and Learning Lab working with Professor Fifi Lee in computer vision, 3D vision, and machine learning for healthcare. Okay, so let's um, start today's presentation. Right. Um, um, I believe most of us are very familiar with the biggest breakthrough in the AI community this year, such that um, now we can just use AI algorithms to generate digital content that human or even human artists are not capable of doing. Um, so I'm actually very impressed by the progress we can make on generative AI this year. For example, we have a stable diffusion that is um, created by a stability. It's a kind of generative AI for image generation based on textual inputs provided by users. Um, we can see that uh, the, the, the generation quality is um, extremely well. Appearances and the behaviors of the objects are very natural and most of the details are very um, photorealistic. Then um, from last year, we have ChatGPT created by OpenAI, which is again, a very powerful and successful generative AI that you can use it to um, chat with and basically you can ask it for anything you like. So um, we have all those successful applications to the generative AI, um, we need to understand what are the underlying models we have behind those applications. So first, we have this um, generative adversarial nets or GANs that was actually uh, created, uh, been created a long time ago, back in 2015 or 2016. And this is probably the first uh, deep learning model demonstrated uh, superior ability of AI for content generation. So um, GAN is actually inspired from human cognition system. It is like uh, we have an artist to draw a picture and have another artist to judge the quality of that drawing. So um, at first, um, the artist doesn't know how to draw or what to draw. So the drawings can be really bad at a, an early stage. But with enough discriminations from the other artists, our drawings become better and better and both the artists start to compete with each other. So uh, we can replace the artists with neural networks and one is the generator and the other one is um, the discriminator. And we put both of the networks under the same uh, adversarial setting and then we have GAN. However, um, this kind of framework is not perfect because there can be many problems. Uh, first, it is actually very hard to balance between generation and discrimination and one cannot be trained very well or the other one will not be able to converge at all. And there are also problems like um, um, mode collapse or training deficiency and um, GAN 
I don't think it can actually generate very high resolution details. So these are the uh, problems. Yeah, um, given all these problems of GANs, a diffusion model was proposed. Unlike GANs that are based on human perceptions, a diffusion model is actually inspired from physics, which I'm not very familiar with. Um, but um, from a high level perspective, in diffusion models, we are dealing with probabilities and we can model the probabilities through a Markov chain with multiple states. Um, each of the states in the chain re represents a um, um, di distribution that can be regarded as um, either a posterior with respect to the previous state or prior distribution with respect to the following state. <laughs> uh, similar, to, uh, similar to GAN, a generation network can be used to learn the mapping between prior to posterior at all of these states. So we can see that uh, both GANs and diffusion models start from a uh, pure Lewis, right? But unlike GANs that have a pair generation discrimination process, um, diffusion models um, don't require discriminations at all, but instead iterating the same generation process at each of the states until the final result is generated. So um, when iterating through the states, we can sample more and more value signals from the intermediate distributions. And this process uh, feels like deloising, right? Because we are uh, gradually recovering um, value signals from noise. So <clears throat> why uh, this model is called diffusion model instead of some name like um, iterative generative model or something like that um, because the name diffusion is actually from physics as well so in physics uh, diffusion is often uh, is often referred to um, a kind of movement of particles in a certain dynamic system and with time going by the particles can move freely in the system and eventually reach um, equilibrium So um, the diffusion process in physics is similar as in the diffusion model. Recall that we can start from an unstructured noise distribution and train a denoising neural network to simulate the movements of particles. And um, uh, eventually we reach equilibrium in the system. In this case, this will be uh, the clean image. Yeah, so, um, but uh, how diffusion model can be guaranteed to generate meaningful images instead of any random images without noise. Uh, for an intuitive uh, demonstration, we represent the space of every possible generations as a square in the left-hand side. And in this case, we have two target distributions that are clusters in the square, which are human faces. And all other regions in the square are considered invalid. <clears throat> so, um, as demonstrated in the uh, right image, the blue dots denote the random samples in a diffusion model, and the black arrows are the gradient directions that can be learned by the Deloitte network. Um, so the network in diffusion models is not only used to denoise signals, but also push the samples into the correct cluster. And that's how diffusion models can be trained to fit to um, any specified data distributions. Yeah. Um, Diffusion models are really powerful. Without too many changes on the architecture or diffusion model uh, or the neural networks, we can generate very realistic images, audios, and text very easily. And um, this makes us to think if diffusion models can be used to generate really good results on common data modalities, um, can we also apply diffusion models onto medical domain to assist and accelerate human health care? Uh, the answer is probably yes. So among all those possible applications in healthcare, in this work, we focus on using diffusion models to denoise diffusion MRIs. Right, um, so I think we're very uh, familiar with the process of MRI acquisition. So the whole process actually takes a lot of time, right? Because if you wanna um, ge generate a very clean scan, we have to tune the magnetic field a lot and that will cost a lot of time. So ideally, um, it takes around several minutes to generate one single clean scan. 
And that is very time consuming. Uh, we can definitely stop at the middle point of the acquisition, and that will give us a noise scan instead. So here, an alternative solution is that um, we can acquire noisy images in a shorter time and train a neural network on top of that to generate their clean correspondences through a deloizing neural network. And um, this whole uh, process can be much more efficient compared to the um, original acquisition. So um, now the problem uh, becomes how to decide the denoise network or, or denoise method to be used under this setting. Uh, can we simply use the denoise method as in um, common natural images? Um, the answer is still probably yes. <clears throat> yeah, so, so um, here uh, I provide a, a short review about the difference between natural images and um, MRI scans. So for natural images, or the kind of images that can be captured by cameras, uh, they usually contain corner signals. And um, this kind of images are usually in 2D uh, dimension. So that means they have um, width and height. And uh, they usually have only one observation. But for MRI scans, things are quite different. First, um, every pixel in MRI scans represents um, the intensities. And the whole MRI scans represent the object in the 3D space. So the scans are actually in 3D as well. So we not only have width, height, and we, only, uh, and we also have the depths. Uh, moreover, we can acquire multiple observations for the same uh, object by adjusting uh, the magnetic field during the acquisition. And eventually we can get this um, uh, three-dimensional uh, array or tensor for natural images that includes width, height, and RGB. But for MRI scans, we can have width, height, depth, and a number of different observations. Okay, so um, now we can uh, formally define our problem. The task we are doing this uh, work is that we want to denoise uh, MRI acquisitions unsupervisedly, and we want to uh, recover anatomical details that have been destroyed during the acquisition, uh, during the efficient acquisition. And the difficulties we are facing right now is that um, there's no pair ground truths can be used, and noise can be uh, actually very easily reduced, but the anatomical patterns, the, the underlying details can be very hard to recover. Okay, um, yeah. So our idea proposed in this work is that we want to um, utilize generative models such that uh, diffusion models um, that can be conditioned on the noisy MRI scans as input to generate a, lo uh, a noiseless clean correspondences with essential anatomical details. And um, here we compare between the baseline method uh, or the baseline diffusion model, aka DDPM, and our conditional diffusion model, DDM square. Uh, we can see that for the unconditional diffusion model, we start from Z, which is a noise distribution, and we um, recurse every state in the Markov chain to generate the final clean image. And um, our uh, observation is that if the input image is noisy and the uh, intermediate states of the Markov chain is also noisy, Maybe we can um, somehow replace some intermediate state with the input image and start the generation from that uh, matched intermediate state instead. And this can um, now be reformulated as a conditional generation. Um, yeah, so um, after we formulate how to generate uh, the clean image based on our input, another problem is that how can we unsupervisedly uh, train a denoising network without any ground truth data? Um, so this kind of method has been proposed uh, a long time ago. For example, we have this J invariance st strategy that was pro uh, proposing noise to noise back in 2018. And the idea of J invariance is that uh, we can assume noise are independently sampled from the same distribution. And um, 
different noisy observations actually represent the same underlying pattern. So we can supervise the training of the denoise network through different noise observations. So no clean ground truth is required at this case. Yeah, so um, based on the previous two observations and formulations, uh, we can now develop our DDM square in three sequential stages. In the first stage, we wanna learn a noise model to represent the noise distribution of our input images uh, through the um, J invariance theory we just uh, presented before. So uh, yeah, um, by doing so, this is actually already an unsupervised learning and, and, and is able to achieve our denoising task already. So why do we need any further stages? One of the primary reasons is that um, the denoising results are not actually very promising. So um, here we compare our results from stage one to the noise input. We can see that also the denoising quality is okay, but the results are over smoothed and um, they lack very essential anatomical details. And um, this is because the method itself is actually still a simple denoise method and it is not able to generate any new content. And that's why we wanna design uh, two more stages uh, to incorporate diffusion models, help us generate better anatomical details and patterns on top of that. In our second stage, um, we want to match the noisy input to a particular intermediate state in the Markov chain, right? Um, so um, to do so, we first obtain the residual noise from noise model we learned at stage one, and we use this noise residual uh, to fit a noise distribution. Note that um, it doesn't really have to be a Gaussian distribution here. Uh, it can be any distribution as long as it, it is consistent with the um, diffusion model. And we still uh, can record that uh, in diffusion model, intermediate distributions at each state represents different noise levels, right? Uh, so we can just somehow find a closest match that has the small least distance between the fitted noise distribution and the intermediate distribution in the Markov chain. Yeah, so uh, in, in the second stage, we can claim that um, a successful match indicates there exists at least one possible sample from the posterior at, at this state in the uh, unconditional Markov chain that is sufficiently close to the noise input. And in this way, a denoise image can be generated by starting the generation at this particular matched state instead. Uh, can I ask a quick question here? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So how do you determine, like what is the metric that you use for determining if, if two distributions are close or not? Uh, so the metric here is actually the distance between two distributions. And um, uh, formally, we can formulate this kind of problem as an optimization uh, optimization problem, right? Because we wanna find uh, the minimum distance between our target distribution and our fitted distribution. But in fact, actually in the Markov chain, uh, there are a definite um, number of states. So so number is actually quite small and we can just directly search for the best match in this um, uh, chain instead. I see, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, so after the previous two stages and in the last stage, uh, we wanna train this um, diffusion model by using another denoise network. And we have also proposed some uh, practical uh, tricks to better train diffusion model, but those tricks are actually um, very heavy in technical details. So maybe I should just skip. Uh, if you are interested, please see our paper for details. Yeah, so, um, after all the three stages, our final results are much better compared to, uh, comparing to the um, stage one results and the input. Um, the denoising quality is much better. Results are enhanced rather than oversmoothed, and uh, essential anatomical details are recovered as well. Um, then we compare our method against the other state of the art uh, on quantitative analysis. Um, so for FA maps, our method can generate the most clear uh, 
clean and clear results. And uh, for relative con contrast noise ratio and relative signal noise ratio, our method can achieve the best scores. And from the qualitative perspective, uh, our method was evaluated on four uh, real world data sets and uh, our method can achieve the best results um, when comparing against every previous method with um, significant uh, Deloitte and quality improvements. And we have also done some ablation studies to prove that uh, all of our proposed components actually contribute equally to the final success. Uh, here we show more results on the uh, synthesized uh, noise. So we first acquire a ground truth image and we manually inject the noise on that ground truth to simulate um, the noise inputs at different noise level. And we can see that our method can still generate very meaningful and clean results at a, a um, very uh, high noise level. But uh, the previous state of the R, P2S, uh, failed to do so. Um, moreover, since, since our method is actually a generative, uh, a generative method, uh, we can always um, remove the uh, requirement on the conditional input, and we can treat the whole framework as an unconditional generation framework, and we can generate um, those uh, new samples unconditionally, and here are the sample results we can get by unconditionally sampling from our diffusion models. And all. All of these results uh, do not exist in the world, but um, they do look much uh, photorealistic to me and maybe uh, to some radiologists as well. Um, yeah, I think that's all for my presentation today. Uh, if you are really interested in this kind of work, please refer to our paper instead. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Tiang. It was. Um very interesting to see how you can apply diffusion models for um, denoising problems. Um, yeah, I guess before we get started on questions, maybe we can give a round of applause to our speaker today. So thank you very much. Um, well yeah, I'll leave the floor open for questions. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, um, <clears throat> I guess, my first question is, uh, how long did it take you to train the model? Because uh, I feel like diffusion models are kind of notorious yeah. for taking a long time to train. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's actually a very good question. Um, so uh, in my case, when using only one GPU, that usually takes, um, I don't know, um, like 20 hours to train one single model for a data set. Okay. And I guess piggybacking on that question, did you, is the inference time also like pretty high? Like I know that one of the drawbacks of the diffusion models are if you, uh, you have to true, true. That's a very good question as well. Uh, yeah, so um, com compared to the previous um, uh, one single network-based denoise method, uh, our method indeed requires much more time for inference. So in my memory, uh, maybe that requires several seconds to infer one scan, but, but it is still very fast uh, um, compared to the original acquisition using the MRI equipment. Got it, okay. Okay, I have a few questions. First yeah. one, is what type of sequence were you using for this task? Uh, uh, all right. Uh, so that could be uh, beyond my knowledge. So I actually use the sequence that um, the radiology gives me. So I'm not sure what kind of sequence that is, but um, as mentioned before, I treated it as a 4D array with different properties. Uh, so that would be enough for this algorithm to run. Okay, um, because I'm not sure if it's a T1, T2, flare, what type of sequence it is, because it really it makes, 
a difference in which type of uh, sequence you are using. Yeah. So sure. If you are trying to generate diffusion MRI, that means you're trying to, for example, uh, try to generate sequences where water and fat have different properties in the brain or in the abdomen. So diffusion yeah. tensor is, is one, diffusion weighted imaging is another. Um, so it's really important to know how well the model does in terms of the specific sequence, or even if it is, even if it can be translated from one sequence to another sequence. For example, if you want to go from T1 MRI mm -hmm. to T2 MRI. Um, so I guess you haven't, it sounds like you haven't done experiments regarding transformation from one sequence to another sequence. Is that correct? No, I haven't. No. Yeah. Okay, so it's just for one particular sequence, like yeah. a diffusion tensor weighted image or something like that. Okay. Um, so one other question that I had was you mentioned that this was a 3D volume, right? So True. the entire MRI volume is a 3D volume. So are you generating these uh, conditional, um, conditionally denoised volumes? Mm -hmm. um, are they 3D volumes or are you doing slice by slice? Uh, I'm, I'm actually doing slice by slice, but I have also uh, run another experiment doing 3D directly. And uh, experimental results indicated that uh, using slice wise uh, process is actually, can actually provide much better results than a uh, 3D wise process. I see. That's interesting. Why do you think that's the case? Um, I, um, so from my perspective, I think that uh, it probably depends on the capacity of the network, because if you want to handle 3D data, we actually require more network parameters to remember the knowledge. But uh, for 2D slices, that could be much easier because we have so many uh, of well-developed techniques or neural networks that can be, uh, can be directly applied on 2D images. So we can use that 2D image networks directly on the 2D slice uh, instead of um, improving the um, some sorts of 2D networks into the 3D volume networks. I see, okay. Um... That's interesting because what doesn't make really that what doesn't really make sense is these natural images that we have, yeah, from the, like you know from cameras or from monocular video monocular video or something like that. These are RGB or RGBA images, and when they do uh, diffusion uh, based assessment on those images, those are effectively you can consider them as two point five D images. Mm -hmm. So you know like three channel or four channel input images. So technically you could utilize three channel input images from the MRI volume mm -hmm. as well for generating the, uh, for generating a single slice or generating three slices at the same time. Um, have you tried experimenting with that? Uh, I don't think we have tried experimenting on that. Okay. Um, the other thing that I had in terms of questions was, mm -hmm. well, um, first and foremost, these MRI sequences look really, really clean. Um, that's probably because you know you did skull stripping of the pa of the patient's brain, um, so the, pa the patient's you know skull and surrounding CSF fluid is taken away. But yeah. I'm wondering if these types of uh, and and also, I guess the main point is that there is no motion artifact. And right, right, right. True. MRI is very notorious for motion artifacts because. You, as soon as the patient moves, even if they're doing um, breath holds or whatever, right, 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 then instantly change the magnetic field strength applied at that specific spot in the brain, and therefore you will see like a ghosting artifact or something like that that might show up in the image. So, is your model able to handle that, or was the model trained on that type of data, or was it just mainly clean? Um, I think our method was not designed particularly for this kind of artifacts, but um, in terms of motion handling, maybe you can add some sort of pre-processing that we can first align the motions at an early stage and then use our method as a post-processing to generate a clean results. I see. Um, okay. I'm not entirely sure if that's an easy task to accomplish, but yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Thank you so much for your suggestions. Yeah, um, 
I'm aware that uh, we have a question in the chat box. Uh, did you test on denoising data from different manufacturers or institutions? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so actually, um, uh, right, maybe so I can just read out the question so that our audience will know. So okay. I think Ramon's question was um, like, was this tested on like data from different manufacturers or institutions and how do these diffusion models um, actually generalize? So. Okay, um, so for the uh, first part, uh, I have evaluated our method on four real world data sets. And among those four data sets, I think uh, two of the data sets uh, actually come from Stanford and the other two data sets come from other institutions. So, uh, that is not a problem for our method, I think. Uh, for the second part, in terms of the generalization ability, that could be a really huge issue. So for now, uh, we have to train one single model for one single data set uh, or one single data sequence. And that is not able to generalize to any other different data sequences. So that could be a problem indeed. A uh, follow-up question on that, uh, what, what do you think would be the reason why um, the model isn't able to generalize to other institutions? Um, that's a really good question. I think, um, yeah, one of the biggest challenges could be uh, the, 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 the disparities um, of the data intrinsics. So maybe we, uh, uh, the acquired data sets from different institutions have uh, very different settings or different uh, intrinsics, like they can have very different spacings or something like that. And those kind of uh, misalignment can really cause troubles for neural networks to, to learn, especially for diffusion models uh, that require very processed annotations. So yeah, that could be a really huge problem. So I have two more questions, sorry. Um, yeah. one, the first one is uh, just to clarify what your input data was for this process. What you did was you, I, I'm assuming you didn't do this, but um, basically the patient was undergoing scanning and then instead of, instead of getting the full uh, sequence, Mm -hmm. All the way, like, you know, if it's a T2 or T1 or flare image, it might take seven minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. instead of doing 10 minutes worth of imaging, you decided to stop the imaging session earlier. Right. And so the data is actually real patient data. It's not like synthetically applied Gaussian noise applied to those images. Uh, these four data sets are real world data sets from real patients. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask was, so the results look, you know, fairly good, but what are potential pitfalls or failures that you've seen in your in your model? Where does it where does it fail? Yeah, that that is a good question as well. So uh, one of the biggest pitfalls I can observe is that, um, yeah. Um, because our method is kind of generation methods, right? So it can actually generate contents that may not exist in this particular environment. Uh, but that's actually quite uh, crucial for clinical usage, right? Because in clinical um, scenario, we want everything to be precise. We want uh, this um, uh, denoise scan to reflect the uh, real, the absolute, actual uh, patterns of the patients. But by using our generation approach, um, the, the recovered details cannot be guaranteed to be the actual case. So that could be a huge problem or the um, biggest people I can observe. Right, but the other pitfall that I can also argue is that if it takes you seven minutes to actually, um, seven, seven minutes to get you that full sequence or even 10 minutes to get you that full sequence and if you stop, let's say the model training by, not some model training, the sequence acquisition uh, at the third minute, the fourth minute, and then you pass your data in either case space or if you pass it in the time domain to your model. And if it takes like two minutes to generate uh, a volume from that, from that data, 
then you're not really saving much time, so to speak, yeah. because you're saving maybe like one minute in the long long run. Um, but if we, <laughs> but that one minute is not really beneficial, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the diffusion model has its pros and cons, and it's not particularly it's not particularly great right now because it doesn't have that many um, uh, it doesn't have that many uh, advantages in terms of time, but also in terms of the exact things that you mentioned, like you have to actually generate these real regions in the image, mm -hmm. which correspond to, you know, maybe like there is a tumor in the brain that you haven't looked at um, that the patient has. Right, 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 true. Yeah. Just food for thought. Yeah, yeah, I, I just love this on comments. Actually, Actually, the, the question of uh, Tejas ask is very true. That sometimes we say it's denoisy model. We think uh, you kind of denoid. Actually, sometimes it's it's the true noise. It, it, what we process is as some fake lesion, even fake lesion, or or, right. or just regard the lesions from the. It, it means that it's. It, I think it's very common since in the denoisy field because we don't know the truth. You don't know what is the true signal, what is noisy. So sometimes it's really hard to distinguish. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, but uh, actually, when when I see this topic, it, I was kind of uh, I just surprised because the diffusion model is kind of generation. Right. It basically, right. is generation from nothing. True. But, true. But it, but the, and and the the, the 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 image that is generated is it, we can call it a fake. It's a fake. Yeah. Model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you you use it to denoising the MRI images. So actually, the image of MRI we want to it's it be real, mm -hmm. to reflect the real lesion, real right. real tumor on it. So do you ever consider that uh, what kind of what if the, the diffusion model create a new things mm -hmm. of this uh, image because the 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 the, the yeah. Because in the natural image, you, you create a new scenes is the art, but in the right, natural right. scenario, you create a new scenes is a is a is a disaster. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So um, I I think uh, one possible workaround for this is that we can somehow design a better condition algorithm, so um, our method can have less freedom of generation. But have better restrictions on a uh, conditioning on this particular input, and that way we can somehow eliminate um, the uh, risk of generating fake data. I see. Cool. Well, what, what's your future plan? Are you going to work uh, on it continuous? Or are you totally to another project? Uh, that actually depends on my supervisor. <laughs> so I don't have too much to say here. I see. Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, I had a question both for Kyung as well as the rest of the audience. Um, mm -hmm. So while the problem of generating fake data or synthetic data is, is um, a, like, maybe bad for this, this particular application, would it be like actually good to develop these synthetic data sets to actually augment um, like real images to, to provide more training data for other types of models. Like, can this be used as a way to generate um, synthetic data sets that we can use for other applications? Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, so maybe not from this particular work, but um, I recently uh, have heard that uh, there exists a similar work that also uses some sorts of generating models to generate, uh, to generate fake medical data. And this kind of data uh, can be used for um, education purposes or, um, in, I don't know, enriching the training data set of another model uh, that can be used as an application for, uh, um, I don't know, maybe discriminating what is real and what is fake. So yeah, some application like that could be helpful uh, with this kind of generative model as a um, uh, prior. And so do you think there is like enough room to play around with how much you condition um, on your real image to kind of get the spectrum of, oh, it's really close to a real image or 
kind of far and it's more close to being a synthetic image or something. Yeah, 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 right. Cool, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, then if not, let's thank our speaker again. Um, we'll put up the video on uh, our YouTube channel if you have, um, and if you have further questions, you can always reach out to our speaker or you can reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with him. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and see you all next week.